Okay, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to the second day of uh, the Geography of Innovation Conference 2020. Uh, very happy to see that uh, all of you have made it back today, uh, even after the Viking experience last night. Uh, so, uh, just to let you know, uh, tonight there is a gala dinner uh, at the uh, Atlantic Hotel downtown. Uh, you do need a ticket, uh, or you have to have registered uh, for the dinner. Uh, so, uh, please, uh, if you have not registered, uh, uh, then uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, I think now, no chance of, of joining the dinner. Uh, and if you are unsure, then please check with uh, reception, because we are sold out for the dinner. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, please uh, uh, check whether you have registered and signed up for the dinner before uh, tonight's event. There will be buses leaving at 7.45 uh, outside the hotel, uh, like uh, yesterday. Uh, a second piece of practical information, uh, the footbridge uh, over to the Bouvet room uh, is closed today. Uh, so uh, to get to the sessions in the Bouvet room, uh, you will have to leave the building, walk around the ice hockey arena to the front of the arena, which is the opposite side from the hotel, and then enter through the main entrance of the ice hockey arena. There will be uh, students and volunteers in their white t-shirts showing you the way how to get there. Uh, so the bonus is you get some fresh air and you get to see uh, the ice hockey arena, uh, but please do leave uh, some time uh, to get from here and over to the sessions that are in the Bouvet room, probably at least a five-minute walk. Uh, then uh, we will start today's uh, plenary session, uh, and it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Marek Gertler for the first uh, of the keynote talks. So Marek, I think, uh, also needs no introduction. Uh, he has been an active researcher in our community for a lot of years. Uh, but I suppose if you are uh, fairly new, like me, I guess, to this community, then uh, Merrick will have been uh, a rector uh, and working in putting uh, some of our research into practice uh, for quite a while. And we are extremely happy to hear about how he has actually done that in practice at the University of Toronto, uh, and uh, uh, that he has also taken time out of his very ambitious schedule as the rector uh, to be here with us today and, and share his experiences uh, from uh, from the U of T. So please, uh, Marek, uh, the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much, Rune. Um, as a Canadian, my only disappointment is that this session isn't in the ice hockey arena. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, more seriously, um, I am really delighted to be here and to see so many familiar faces. And it's also a great pleasure uh, to share this session today with my Toronto colleague, Shiri Bresnitz. My topic today is a familiar one, and that is the role that universities play in catalyzing the economic transformation of their host economies. I hope to provide a fresh perspective on this topic, one that highlights a more active and deliberate role played by research universities. Now, given my day job, which you can see on the screen here, uh, I shall not surprisingly draw heavily on the recent experience of the University of Toronto, aka U of T, which has been at the epicenter of a fascinating transformation of the local economy. The role of universities in stimulating local economic change has been well recognized for many years, with the most celebrated cases, including regions like Silicon Valley, with Stanford and UC Berkeley, Boston and Cambridge Mass with MIT and Harvard, and Cambridge UK with, of course, Cambridge University. Such cases normally emphasize factors like uh, the quality of the institution's research, its faculty and its graduates, its policy pertaining to the ownership of IP, or the extent to which its local culture fosters or tolerates entrepreneurial activity by faculty and students. Uh, these are some of the critical determinants of a university's impact on local economic dynamism. The literature also highlights the importance of the availability of affordable space and support services for spin-off firms founded by university faculty or students, either on campus or nearby. Now, such considerations undoubtedly remain very important, and Shiri is going to shed valuable new light uh, on how uh, universities support entrepreneurship. What I want to argue today is that the literature may not fully reflect the wider scope 
and intentionality of the role that research universities are coming to play in reshaping their local economies. And I characterize this process as curation, which implies, uh, by the very term, an active and strategic rather than a passive stance assumed by universities. This role entails the deliberate creation of new organizations and new institutions, new rules of the game that remake the regional innovation system in important ways. My inspiration for this argument comes from the remarkable case of Toronto, where recent developments attest to a startling economic transformation. Uh, and this is the view, I guess, from the University of Toronto's main campus looking south. Uh, you can see the kind of financial district here, all the tall buildings. Um, the university's southern boundary is more or less here along College Street. Uh, these two white towers have not yet been, been built, but I'm going to come back and talk about them. And this is Hospital Row along University Avenue where we've got uh, half a dozen of Canada's most research intensive uh, hospitals, all of which are affiliated with the University of Toronto. So an amazing cluster of economic activity and big brains. So let me introduce my story with a few key observations about recent economic change in Toronto. First, in its uh, 2019 Tech Talent Report, CBRE reported that Toronto created more tech jobs over the five-year period from 2013 to 2018 than any other metropolitan region in North America, except for the San Francisco Bay Area. And you can see that Toronto is a, a close second to San Francisco. And as you can see from this slide, Toronto outshone New York City, Seattle, Los Angeles, Boston, and many other cities by wide margins. And when this, this uh, research appeared, actually the year before in, in an earlier iteration of this, it was a head-snapping moment for a lot of people who had a sort of qualitative understanding that things were going on in the city, but this was really the first time that quantitatively it was con confirmed. Second, Toronto has recently been ranked as one of the world's top environments for startups, fourth in North America, according to Valuer, uh, behind uh, some esteemed company there, and 14th in the world overall. Third, as of the third quarter of 2019, Toronto's downtown office market was the tightest in North America with a vacancy rate of just 2.4%. Even San Francisco had a higher vacancy rate at 3.9%. Boston, Manhattan, and Seattle were all north of 7%, and Toronto's at 2.4%. So another indicator of, uh, of things happening in that city. And fourth, according to, to one recent study, Toronto has now got the highest concentration of AI startups in the world. Indeed, the emerging local boom in AI and machine learning in particular is one of the most significant factors behind Toronto's emergence as a tech, employment, and entrepreneurship hotspot. Now, in addition to the impressive statistics on startups, the past few years have also seen a steady stream of incoming investments by global and national tech companies, all of whom are seeking to tap into Toronto's red-hot machine learning scene. And this slide shows you the logos of uh, just a sample of the recent entrance. Well, given all these developments, it's perhaps not too surprising that we have also hosted a steady stream of visiting delegations from both foreign governments and universities. Indeed, the presidents of Johns Hopkins, University of Michigan, University of Illinois, and Tsinghua University have all paid visits to Toronto and the University of Toronto just within the past four months. So I spend a fair bit of my time hosting visitors. All right, so that's a quick a snapshot of what's going on. Um, but you know, standing back, you know, what's driving this and, and what role has U of T played in all of this? Well, as I have already hinted, at the heart of this remarkable transformation has been Toronto's emergence as a leading global center for research and innovation in machine learning. But it wasn't always thus. In contrast to the impressive statistics that I have just cited, the picture looked very different just a few years ago. 
So let's wind the clock back to 1987, uh, when a fellow named Jeffrey Hinton first arrived at the University of Toronto's Department of Computer Science. You can tell this is a picture from the 80s. I won't, won't go into detail. Um, Jeff came to Toronto from Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. Um, and, you know, was working away at uh, CMU, great university, he had nevertheless become increasingly concerned about the dominance of the U.S. Department of Defense as a source of grants for the fundamental research in artificial neural networks that he was then undertaking, perhaps another aspect of the dark side of innovation, picking up on a theme from, from yesterday. At the time, and for the next two decades, Jeff and his protégés were seeking to build new computational frameworks mimicking the structure and workings of the brain, uh, frameworks that were untested and quite controversial. Canada and Toronto held special appeal for Jeff because of the availability of research funds from two key sources, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, and subsequently the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, aka CIFAR, whose pioneering program in neural computation and adaptive perception was established and led by Hinton. It has since been renamed Learning in Machines and Brains. As many of you will know, uh, Jeff's pathbreaking work is now celebrated around the world. In fact, these days he is often called the godfather of deep learning, obviously a more recent photograph and a better haircut. <laughs> now, as Jeff states rather humbly on page 41 of his CV, and I quote, the, the deep learning methods for recognizing phonemes in speech and objects in images that were developed in my group at the University of Toronto revolutionize speech recognition and object recognition. Indeed, in 2012, a team led by Hinton won the ImageNet large-scale visual recognition challenge by a considerable margin. And machine learning, driven by deep neural networks, vast data sets, and high-performance computing power, literally took off. It is indeed the process behind many of the major AI achievements of the past decade, from computer vision to autonomous vehicles to real-time translation. Hinton's pivotal role in these breakthroughs was recently recognized when he won the AM Turing Award, uh, loosely known or referred to as the Nobel Prize in Computing. Jeff won it jointly with CIFAR colleague Joshua Bengio and one of his former postdocs, Jan LeCun, who's now at NYU. So what happened next is where my story really begins, uh, the story of curating local innovation ecosystems. Hinton founded a startup called DNN Research with two of his graduate students in 2012. It was acquired by Google the following year, and Jeff took a half-time role as distinguished researcher and then VP and engineering fellow in Mountain View. He became university professor emeritus at U of T. In fact, one of my uh, most important moves as an administrator was convinced Jeff to convince Jeff not to resign, but to retire. Uh, so that he would uh, retain a, a connection to the University of Toronto. And uh, indeed, he continued to supervise graduate students and, and still does to this day. Not surprisingly, though, uh, Jeff's students and his postdocs were in high demand, sought by uh, Google, uh, Apple, and Uber, and Microsoft, uh, and many others. And this uh, graphic gives you an idea of the, the long reach of Jeff's lab. Uh, and you can see some of the logos here. What you may not be able to make out is the geography. So these are all in places outside of Toronto. Mountain View, you know, London, uh, another Mountain View, Palo Alto, San Francisco, New York, Redmond, Washington, Cupertino, California. So we were populating AI uh, and machine learning research centers, most in the private sector, um, around the world. Um, and uh, an impressive picture on many levels. But clearly, this story of undeniable scientific success and influence with widespread and growing commercial impact was not a story about economic benefit for Toronto or for Canada. 
Instead, Toronto was facing a classic brain drain. Its top homegrown talent was being recruited away to take on attractive opportunities in other cities and countries, largely in the private sector. And little of the commercial benefit arising from Jeff's breakthroughs was being enjoyed in Toronto. So what happened between 2013, when the IP that launched Jeff's startup was acquired by Google, and today, when Toronto has now become home to a dynamic and growing innovation ecosystem built around AI and machine learning? Well, a watershed moment occurred in November of 2016, when the University of Toronto joined a small group of local leaders who were motivated by the sense of opportunity and also potential opportunity lost that these kinds of developments represented. The group included Ed Clark, a former banker turned senior advisor to the Government of Ontario, and I also, I have to add, a proud University of Toronto alumnus, uh, and some of Jeff Hinton's former students who were active in the fledgling local AI startup scene. They came together to advocate for the creation of something that came to be called the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence, an independent research lab that would drive excellence and leadership in Canada's knowledge, creation, and use of artificial intelligence to foster economic growth and improve the lives of Canadians. Appropriately, Jeff Hinton was named as Vector's chief scientific advisor, and his former PhD student, Rich Zemmel, uh, also a U of T computer science professor, uh, became Vector's research director. Garth Gibson, an expat Canadian at Carnegie Mellon, uh, was recruited back to Toronto to take on the CEO role. The province of Ontario committed $50 million to support the Institute, which was formally announced only in March of 2017, so less than three years ago. The Government of Canada followed the province, pledging its support as part of a new $125 million pan-Canadian AI strategy, with similar levels of support flowing to complementary initiatives in Montreal and Edmonton. Perhaps most significantly, more than 30 private sector companies committed a combined total of over $80 million to the project. And this latter point is important, and it underscores the rather unique model at the heart of the Vector experiment, and it is still very much an experiment. Vector is a center for both fundamental and applied research with faculty members and faculty affiliates, and yet uh, we set it up deliberately as a kind of arm's length organization independent from the University of Toronto. And we did this for four reasons at least. First, to provide greater freedom for associated faculty to determine how they spend their time fundamental or applied research, teaching, supervision, it's really up to them. Secondly, uh, to enable faculty to earn higher salaries than they would otherwise earn as a conventional professor. Third, to allow faculty to establish or maintain appointments at U of T or other af affiliated universities in the region, enabling them to supervise graduate students. And here I will just note that Vector also funds a large scholarship program for graduate students at accredited institutions in the region to help grow the local supply of machine learning talent. And f the fourth reason why it was set up as a kind of arm's length independent institution was to signal to the private sector its enthusiasm for, its, its openness to engaging with industry partners. In fact, private sector partners uh, have been attracted to join Vector as partner sponsors uh, for a number of reasons that motivate them, and particularly the prospect of securing privileged access to graduate student talent and cutting-edge researchers in machine learning with whom they can solve technical challenges, engage in joint research, and learn more about how machine learning can transform their business. Indeed, one of Vector's primary objectives is to facilitate the dissemination or diffusion of new machine learning tools throughout the economy, to assist local startups who need assistance in scaling their businesses, and also to drive the transformation of existing business models within larger established firms in more mature sectors. Indeed, a testament to the success uh, that Vector has achieved in bridging the classic divide between research and translation 
for commercial application, uh, a divide that has traditionally bedeviled Toronto's innovation ecosystem. A uh, testament to that success is the number and the range of partner firms that Vector has attracted. Uh, as this is a, a long list here, but they are distributed across many sectors of the local economy, including healthcare, ICT, finance, insurance, transportation, education, retail, construction, and advanced manufacturing. And while they include global tech giants like Google, Uber, and NVIDIA, the list also includes major Canadian firms, including all of the big five banks, major insurance companies like Manulife and Sun Life, Canada's two largest auto parts producers, Magna and Linamar, and Air Canada. And they are also joined by a large number of homegrown startups that are now aspiring to scale up in fields like healthcare and workplace benefits, medical technologies, drug discovery, legal services, entertainment content development, robotics, and more. Well, telling the story like this makes it sound much smoother and easier than it actually was to get to this point. For starters, persuading governments to contribute the lead funding to a Toronto-based initiative, the city that the rest of the country loves to hate, uh, when governments are more accustomed to distributing their investments widely, shall we say, rather than targeting them geographically to amplify existing strengths, um, this required concerted advocacy on the part of uh, the university and our many partners and coordinated leadership. The result is a powerhouse AI institute for research, commercialization, and education that currently hosts 400 active researchers, including 34 uh, full-time faculty members, 65 faculty affiliates, 41 postgraduate affiliates, and more than 240 postdoc fellows and students. And in the West Tower uh, of the uh, Mars Discovery District in downtown Toronto, this is the, the current home for Vector. So this is, again, just at the southern edge of the um, University of Toronto campus on the south side of, of College Street. Uh, perched uh, at the top of Hospital Row. Now, of the 34 faculty members that I mentioned, 27 of those uh, of 34 are also U of T faculty, and four more are former U of T students or postdocs. Now, the Vector Institute is the realization of a university-led strategic effort to organize and curate Toronto's local innovation ecosystem around one of our world-leading research strengths. The university and its partners made the crucial strategic decision to intervene directly and actively in the organic evolution of Toronto's AI cluster. So that's the sort of case study, but let me step back and try to extract some more general insights from this intriguing story. The first point is about the importance of sustained investment. Toronto's excellence in AI did not emerge overnight. Jeff Hinton's genius and his brilliant students certainly played a central part, but so too did sustained effort for their research over more than 25 years from NSERC and CIFAR, a point that is often lost on government policymakers who typically harbor very unrealistic expectations about the rapid returns on their investments in fundamental research. Indeed, it is all too easy to overlook the crucial importance of patient fundamental research with its many false starts and failures. Governments and the general public they serve are often in an understandable hurry for results. In the case of Hinton and his breakthroughs in machine learning, their overnight success was a quarter century in the making. So clearly there's no substitute for sustained research investments over the long run. But at the same time, steady research funding, I would argue, was a necessary but not sufficient condition for enabling the kind of remarkable developments seen in Toronto. Which brings me to my second point about retaining and attracting talent, uh, where I will argue that money isn't everything. As noted earlier, concerns about brain drain were a primary factor motivating U of T and its local partners to embark on a strategy of deliberately curating Toronto's innovation ecosystem. As you, I'm sure, know, salaries for AI experts in Silicon Valley can run several times higher than faculty salaries at a place like Toronto. 
But the founders of Vector were convinced that salary isn't everything. Freedom to pursue one's curiosity and to determine the optimal mix of research, teaching, and supervisory activities is a huge attractor for top researchers. I'm sure everyone in this room can relate to that. The hypothesis uh, underlying the Vector model was that if opportunities in Toronto could offer unparalleled flexibility along with a significant premium on compensation and the chance to remain a part of U of T's dynamic academic community, it would be hard for top scholars to resist such an offer and to leave, even without matching the salaries in the private sector that they could otherwise uh, earn in the Valley or somewhere else. Now, on top of these attractors, the region's high quality of place has also proved to be a very significant factor. And here I want to tell another little story, uh, a case in point. This is Raquel Ursuson, a, a computer science professor at U of T. Uber wanted Raquel, uh, who is a rising star in machine learning and computer vision, to head up their autonomous vehicle program in Silicon Valley. And she said, no, I like Toronto. And they said, well, how about Pittsburgh? It's a little closer to Toronto. We've got a lab there too. She said, no, you didn't hear me. I don't want to leave Toronto. Uh, so if you want me, you're going to have to come to Toronto. So indeed, Uber did come to Toronto, uh, committing to build a lab around Raquel with 50 researchers. And in Raquel's own words, she could say it better than I can, they were uh, interested in the research I've done in the last few years. I didn't want to move. I wanted to stay here. And Uber was opening, or open to opening a big research lab in Toronto. It's very important for the company's future, and that's why we are here. And then she goes on to say, well, I came to Toronto because I was working in AI. Toronto is a global leader in AI. But Toronto is a very vibrant city, a fantastic place to live. I really like the diversity here. It's a very cosmopolitan city, and as a foreigner, I feel at home in Toronto. So those of you who don't know Toronto, more than 50% of the population in the region of about 6 million people was born outside of Canada. And they come from everywhere, literally every country on the face of the earth. So uh, a rather uh, compelling uh, narrative from Raquel. And perhaps not convincingly, Raquel is also a co-founder of the Vector Institute. And Uber subsequently announced their plans to expand their Toronto ATG lab from the original 50 scientists to 500 scientists, investing over $200 million in the next five years because they were so impressed by what they found in Toronto. This example, I think, supports the view of uh, a guy named Mike Bloomberg, who's in the news these days a lot for other reasons. But back when he was mayor, he said, I've long believed that talent attracts capital far, far more effectively and consistently than capital attracts talent. Incidentally, Raquel's story also provides another example of active curation by the university. In order to enable her to take on her post at Uber, we had to literally rewrite the rules to permit her to retain a 20% appointment at the university for an extended period of time. This would allow her to continue to supervise U of T graduate students, many of whom work in her lab at Uber. We also had to create a new regulatory framework to ensure that her graduate students would have full access to Uber's vast data and advanced computational facilities, while at the same time being free to publish their research findings without any constraints. Now that these new rules have been worked out, we've been able to apply them to other cases where U of T faculty have taken advantage of similar opportunities with other local partners, many of whom have followed Uber by opening research labs in Toronto, including Google. So this was the picture I showed you before. You recall that uh, it painted a geography that excluded Toronto. This is what it looks like now, and this is just a partial uh, version of it, but you've got new labs in the city opened by NVIDIA, by Samsung, by LG, uh, there's Uber, and Google actually set up a lab in Toronto to accommodate Jeff, who for personal reasons, including the fact that he has a bad back and doesn't like to fly, um, you know, was uh, much more convenient. But it was also to tap into uh, the other great things happening in the city. So, you know, just to emphasize again the way this is, is filling in in a, in a pretty interesting way. 
Now, it's important to note that Canada's immigration policies have also played a constructive, a really important role here to support talent attraction and retention. The Canadian government has recently invested heavily to improve immigration services and make immigrating to Canada easier with special emphasis on facilitating work permits and visas for foreign researchers and students. And under Canada's global skills strategy, highly educated professionals can have their visas processed within a month of application and often within two weeks. Um, for comparison, the typical processing time for an H-1B visa in the U.S. can be between five and ten times longer, and the uh, total numbers of H-1B visas, as I'm sure you know, are very, very tightly restricted. The Canada 150 Research Chairs Program, along with the earlier Canada Research Chairs Program, were instrumental in helping attract top-flight talent to U of T, including Raquel Erteson. And the results speak for themselves that 27 U of T faculty members, sorry, we'll just get back for a second, uh, 27 U of T faculty members with appointments at the Vector Institute embody Toronto's remarkable diversity. Uh, these 27 faculty immigrated from or previously worked or studied in 18 different countries before landing in Toronto. And as for Toronto's brain drain, well, as you can see from this slide, uh, it, this, the picture looks rather different. By 2018, Toronto experienced a larger brain gain during the previous five-year period than any of the top 50 metropolitan regions in North America, including the San Francisco Bay Area. My third point is about knock-on effects and leveraging related variety and proximity. The knock-on effects from Toronto's burgeoning AI cluster have been pronounced and will, I think, become even more so over time. As a new platform technology, AI and machine learning have a vast range of possible applications, and Toronto's diverse economy offers abundant related variety and absorptive capacity within the region. U of T's AI-related startups are in fields like medicine, healthcare, pharma, finance, marketing, law, robotics, natural language processing, even retail sales. And the Creative Destruction Lab at our Rotman School of Management now nurtures the world's largest cohort of machine learning-based startups. And these ventures draw on Toronto and U of T's deep pools of specialized and field-specific talent, but they also benefit from the more general support services that all startups require, such as management, consulting, and specialized expertise in finance, uh, human resources, legal, design, and, and so on. Perhaps the uh, most physical manifestation of the knock-on effect is really the next stage in our deliberate curation of Toronto's AI innovation ecosystem. Those are those white towers that I pointed to earlier that I said had not yet been built. Um, the schwartz Reisman Innovation Center was established in 2019 with a $100 million gift the largest donation in U of T's history. The center will be a 750,000 square foot innovation complex, and its goal will be to advance and harness innovations in the related fields of AI and uh, precision and regenerative medicine. The West Tower, which is the shorter of the two towers, which uh, is uh, under construction as we speak, uh, will be the new home for the Vector Institute, which will be moving across the street uh, from Mars uh, into uh, the, the West Tower of Vector. Along with our uh, U of T entrepreneurship programming uh, um, functions, and uh, we also will be accommodating a fairly large number of homegrown uh, machine learning firms that are uh, scaling up. The center will also be home to the schwartz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society, whose mission is to explore and address the ethical and societal implications of AI and other emerging technologies. It has an expressly cross-disciplinary mandate, drawing on U of T's strengths in the humanities and social sciences to ensure that these new technologies are socially beneficial rather than harmful. The, uh, the taller of the two towers, uh, which will be built uh, in a couple of years' time, will be more focused uh, on regenerative and precision medicine um, with wet labs and, and other kinds of appropriate spaces. Well, let me conclude by considering uh, a few further policy uh, implications in addition to the points that I've already made about research funding and immigration policies. 
As universities take a more active role in the development of regional innovation systems, their host cities also have a larger role to play in helping them navigate the course. Producing, attracting, and retaining highly qualified talent should be a top priority for public policy aimed at enhancing the innovative capacity of city regions. Investing in urban infrastructure broadly understood to include things like public transportation, public schools, parks, hospitals, cultural and community facilities. These things enhance a city's power of place and its quality of life, the kinds of things that Raquel was alluding to in her quote. More generally, investments designed to stimulate innovation ought to be targeted and strategic. The goal should be to enhance and support those firms, sectors, and indeed uh, universities that demonstrate unique capabilities and competencies not necessarily picking winners, but backing winners. Now, on this point, the province of Ontario and the Government of Canada showed notable leadership in helping bring the Vector Institute to life, leveraging the assets of a diverse set of committed and well-networked partners. But Canada and Ontario cannot rest on their laurels. Many countries have now followed Canada's lead and are doubling, if not tripling down, uh, on similar kinds of strategies. Well, to conclude, uh, my main argument has been that the role of universities in reshaping their local innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystems may be evolving and expanding. In the case of the University of Toronto, we have done this in at least two ways. We've played an active role in the creation of new organizations, like the Vector Institute, the Creative Destruction Lab, and the Schwartz-Riesman Institute, that have become pivotal elements of the regional innovation system. And second, we have reshaped the rules of the game. We've led a process of institutional change by reshaping the relationship between universities and industrial partners, and by refining and redefining the very essence of what it means to be a faculty member or a graduate student. If U of T's experience is any indication, research universities may now be playing a more purposeful, strategic, and engaged role in actively curating the development of such ecosystems. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to the questions. That is, if we have any time for questions. We do have time for okay. questions. Uh, thank you, Marek. And uh, we'll have our first question over here. Thank you, thank you Marek. Um, that's a really, really compelling story and, a, and a, a very engaging presentation. But I thought there was one really conspicuous absence from the story of tech, which was Sidewalk Labs, which is an international debate in itself, I guess, and uh, which showed, I guess, that civil society also has a role to play in shaping Toronto's tech scene. Yeah. And I wonder whether you could say what U of T has been doing about the Sidewalk Labs controversy. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. That would be a lecture all in itself. <laughs> and maybe I'll give it one day. Um, so for those who don't know, Sidewalk Labs is a subsidiary of Alphabet, the parent company of Google. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, they uh, unveiled plans to build a kind of smart city precinct on the waterfront in Toronto, uh, working in partnership with a tri-level government agency called Waterfront Toronto. For it's municipal, provincial, and federal government. Um, and uh, with lots of sort of science fiction sort of ideas about um, you know, how to uh, embrace smart technologies, uh, sensors, vast quantities of data collected every second of every day by people passing through uh, this precinct of the city in order to um, you know, achieve some laudable goals around sustainability in particular and affordability. So a not uncompelling vision. Uh, included things like uh, mass timber construction, uh, so avoiding concrete, um, making very uh, creative use of uh, shared vehicles, um, and a more kind of efficient use of, uh, and, and more flexible definitions of public open space as well. Uh, so many reasons to be excited, but um, it wasn't long before the bloom was off the rose when people began to ask questions about the data, and this again speaks to some of the things that came up in the dark side of innovation session yesterday. Uh, you know, people realized that um, there'd be lots of sensors tracking what people are doing, 
And all of a sudden, people asked important questions like, well, you know, who has access to that data? How do we ensure that the individuals that generate that data have given their consent uh, for such data to be used for whatever purposes sidewalk labs might have in mind? Uh, who owns the uh, intellectual property associated with the innovations that would not be possible were it not for you know, the government providing this very unique opportunity and the land on which uh, this, uh, this proposed new development uh, would sit. Um, you had people like Shoshana Zuboff, uh, you know, who talked a lot about the age of surveillance capital weighing in uh, with uh, a pretty critical perspective on all of this as well. Suffice to say that a lot has changed in the last few years as civil society, as you suggest, has indeed come forth and, and asserted these concerns in a very compelling way and slowed everything down. Uh, and I think um, emboldened Waterfront Toronto uh, and its government uh, you know, partners to uh, take a much tougher stance in terms of the negotiation with Sidewalk, um, who, by the way, had visions to expand the original 12-acre site to many hundreds of acres on the waterfront while they've been sort of pushed back into the original box. But there are much tougher uh, kind of um, rules now about uh, data access and ownership, uh, which will not be held privately, but be held in a kind of public trust and so on. So the university has played a sort of subtle role in the background. Uh, we've offered up a lot of our experts to comment on this, and many of them have, uh, mostly in a pretty critical way, to, to be honest. And I think that's a good thing, because you know, we don't uh, ever dream of putting words in the mouths of our academics. In fact, we encourage them uh, to exercise their full uh, rights of academic freedom. And so they have been very, very helpful. Um, a number of them have contributed to the um, the process of uh, reimagining what kinds of new institutional structures one would need in order to uh, manage this very precious resource. I will point out that uh, while Sidewalk Labs in Toronto was the first of these high profile smart city um, initiatives and received attention from around the world, it's not going to be the last. There are going to be many, many more, and the same issues that have surfaced in Toronto around sidewalk are going to be surfacing everywhere else in the world where such developments are occurring. So the point is, you know, Toronto has to find a way not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. If they can develop a set of institutions and rules that uh, appropriately and properly protects the privacy and the rights of individuals, while at the same time enabling a really interesting uh, and more sustainable form of urban development to be, you know, to proceed, then I think the world will beat a path to their door. Let me put it this way. Uh, would you rather have a made in Toronto model for a smart city or a made in Beijing model or even a made in Singapore model? So, uh, subject for a longer discussion. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yes, here. Wait for the microphone. Maureen McKelvey. I just had a question about the scale of this, because if we look at the, um, uh, particularly your first slide when everyone was leaving, and I'm particularly interested in the, the graduate students. So what's the scale of the graduate students both before and now, and is, yeah. is that an important part? Yeah. It's, it's much larger. Um, and, you know, listening to the researchers, it was really clear that uh, not only having the freedom and ability to continue to supervise graduate students, but the funding to bring in more is really critical. So we've already more or less doubled the number of graduate students uh, in this field. It's a little hard to do exact counting because they are spread over a number of different disciplines, even inside the university. So computer science is the most obvious one. But you find them in electrical and computer engineering. You find them in the faculty of medicine. You find them in other engineering disciplines. Uh, you even find them in some social science areas where people are, you know, now um, doing work that intersects with, uh, with these core technologies. But in general, the story is, yes, there has been substantial investment. And I did mention that one of Vector's priorities was to create this new scholarship program that allows affiliated universities, U of T, but others in the city and nearby, like Waterloo, to also, you know, dramatically grow the size of their graduate programs. 
Okay, uh, so thank you, Merrick. Um, I'm going to do something that we forgot to do yesterday. We will make it up to the keynote speakers, and that is to hand out uh, these gifts. Uh, so uh, uh, if you ask any Norwegian uh, to name one innovation, in innovation from Norway, they would probably say this, which is uh, the cheese slicer, a decidedly low-tech uh, innovation, <laughs> and what, which is extremely widely used in Norway, but perhaps does not have the geographical scope uh, that it deserves. <coughs> so hopefully this will contribute to widening that scope. So oh, thank, thank you, you so much.